Today we're going to look at a lab that's going to demonstrate the flexibility and the power of using a GRE tunnel versus a traditional VPN uh, connection between sites. So here's what we have for our scenario that we're going to be playing with today. We have a company, they have two sites, uh, which in this map are designated by R1 and R2. Both of these sites have a connection to the internet on a public IP space. Uh, router 1 with the 162 over here and, and site 2 which uh, R2 is the 14512 space and behind each of these routers just for demonstration purposes uh, we have an uh, RFC 1918 IP space that uh, they might be using for their client networks let us say. What this company would like to do is they would like to have these two offices see each other so the users can communicate with each other, share documents back and forth, access resources, uh, typical things like that that uh, you know two offices for the same company would want to do. So there's a couple options to do this. The uh, you know one of the most popular they're, they're all going to involve the same technology but one of the ways you would do this is have maybe a VPN uh, appliance device sitting here that would go you know through this link through the internet back down to this site uh, to router two and the two routers would see each other through the internet and you could encapsulate that and secure that with current VPN technology uh, and that is certainly a viable way to do it. What we're going to do in this video is take that a step further. We're going to create a secure VPN tunnel like that, but we're going to use a GRE tunnel to do that, and that stands for Generic Routing and Encapsulation Tunnel. Uh, this is going to give us a, a couple of nice advantages for the network administrator at the site. First thing that it's going to do is from a router perspective, it's going to create a virtual interface on router 1 and router 2 that that traffic will appear to flow across. So we won't have to worry about traffic going out to the internet, hopping through the internet hosts um, for troubleshooting and, and tracking purposes. You know, physically it certainly does that. Logically, we're going to have an interface between these two routers. The other, the second big benefit of GRE is that it, it allows us to run a, an IGP routing protocol. So in our demonstration, these two devices are going to be connected via VPN using a GRE tunnel and they're going to be in the same OSPF area and we're going to see that they can transfer OSPF uh, information between them two so they'll get route updates from each other and they'll become OSPF neighbors in the same area and of course the third benefit of GRE which um, I mentioned earlier is that it will be using standard uh, encryption for VPN tunnels. So our data is going to be sec uh, secure and safe. Going, it's still going to be going through the internet. It will be encapsulated into this GRE tunnel. So what we're going to do is start with this. Two different sites connected to the internet and we want to turn it into this. Two different sites still connected to the internet. We're going to create this virtual GRE tunnel between them. It's going to be a layer 3 tunnel and these two devices will be in the same OSPF area and they're gonna we're gonna see that they're gonna become OSPF neighbors and they're gonna trade uh, update each other with OSPF route updates so the router 2 over here will see this network and router 1 over on, on at this site will be able to get to this network via OSPF so let's get started on how we're gonna make that happen okay I've updated our network map with a little bit more information about what we're going to do in, in this first phase uh, we're going to do two things here. One is we're going to configure OSPF, get it up and running on each of these routers, and then we're going to create the tunnel interfaces as our second step. Uh, we're going to configure the tunnel interfaces, which is step three, and when we do that we're going to see some interesting behavior that happens uh, with a tunnel interface that you wouldn't see with a physical interface, and I'll point that out when we get to it. Uh, the fourth thing we're going to have to do is because this tunnel interface is our layer 3, uh, we're going to have to make a tweak to our OSPF. I could do that ahead of time, but I want to show you, you know, the logical order that we would do these things and encounter these in. So we're going to have to go back and tweak OSPF just slightly once we have our GRE tunnel interfaces up and running. And then, of course, the last thing that we're going to do is look at OSPF, make sure we can ping across the tunnel, make sure OSPF neighbors uh, are coming up, and we'll do some trace routes and some ping tests and some, uh, some displays of the routing tables to make sure that our tunnel is indeed being used from a logical 
perspective. So let's get started on router one with creating uh, the first step up there, which is creating our OSPF routing process. So let me drag this into the window. Okay, so here we are on router one. Let's get into the router and we're going to create just a real quick and dirty uh, OSPF process. So now uh, we're going to start with router, if I can type today, uh, OSPF, one, two, three. That's just what our process ID is going to be. Uh, we're going to say network and on the router's one side our network is 192.168.10 which we can see right down there. 192.168.1.0, 0.0.0.0. Uh, remember with uh, OSPF you have to enter in the wildcard mask rather than the subnet mask and we're gonna put that in area 0 and that's all we're gonna do for OSPF uh, on router 1 let uh, let me get this out of the way and we'll bring in router 2 and we'll do the same basic config on router 2 so here's router 2 in the window and remember this one is 10 1 1 excuse me, 10110 slash 24. So in our config, router OSPF123, the process ID needs to be the same. Network is going to be 10.1.1.0.0.0.0.255. And that's also going to be in area 0. So there's the network we want to advertise in OSPF and we're putting it into area, area zero. Uh, what didn't, oh, we got a, got a space in there. All right, so there we go. Let's get that out of there. Okay, we are now ready. We have OSPF uh, configured on both sides. And the reason I did that ahead of time is so we can see the neighbor relationships form real time. Uh, as we bring up the tunnel. Now normally you would uh, probably want to get your tunnel up first, your encryption in place, things like uh, you know the basic housekeeping before you'd start to route traffic across the tunnel. I'm doing it slightly out of order here just for illustrative purposes. Um, so here we are back on router one. Okay so we've, we've, we've finished step one there. We've created the OSPF routing process. Now we're on to step two, which is to create the tunnel interfaces. Creating a tunnel interface is 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 very much the process like creating a loop back on a on a Cisco device. It's a virtual interface, and you just create it. It's not a uh, you just tell the router I'm making up this interface. Very much like creating a like I said a loop back or an SVI a VLAN interface. So we're going to say we want to create interface tunnel. We'll just call it tunnel zero. Now, when we do our tunnel interfaces, uh, so there, we created the tunnel interface, it put it to down. When we do our tunnel interfaces, we've got to tell it a couple of things. Uh, first of all, our first command that we're going to use is tunnel source. Now, the tunnel source, let me do a question mark, it can be the IP address or it can specify an interface. What we're going to do in, in this case, when we look at our network map, from router one's perspective, the source of the tunnel where it's going to start is going to be fast zero zero because that's connected to the internet, and its destination is going to be this public IP address over on fast zero zero on router two. So on router one, we're going to specify the source is fast slash zero fast zero slash zero. Okay, now I'm going to do something I should have done earlier, but I want to do ping. I want to make sure this router can actually get to the internet. Okay, again, good enough. Okay, so our tunnel source is fast zero zero. The next thing we need to do is specify the destination. Now the tunnel destination is the public IP address over on this side. So we're going to type that in 4512.153, 45.12.153. 53 dot uh, the IP address on that interface is 202. 202. Now we're going to see something interesting happen when we hit the enter key here. So we've got our source and our destination for the tunnel. And look at that. We get a message that tells us our interface tunnel 00 has gone to an 
up upstate. How can that be? The tunnel interface is logical. It does not have a built-in keep alive statement like you would see from a Cisco device on a, in a physical interface. So in order to rectify that, we are actually going to add a keep alive statement. We'll say three seconds. Just, I'm just kind of making these numbers up. Now, once we do that, we're going to see that um, it's going to try and do a keep alive, and our tunnel interface will go down um, because there really is nothing that it's communicating with on the far side. There we go. The tunnel interface changed state to down. It couldn't communicate. The keep alive failed, so it truly put our tunnel in the accurate status, which would be an up-down status. So now we have the tunnel interface created on router one. We can see it if we do uh, do show IP interface brief. So there's our tunnel interface. It's in an up down status, the bottom line here. So we have to add a few more things to it uh, to bring it up to what we want. First thing is we need to assign it an IP address. We want this to be a layer three interface. So just like any other interface, we're going to assign it an IP address based on our network diagram back here. The interfaces are 10, 10, 1. This is going to be dot 1. This is going to be dot 2 on a, on a slash 30 interface. So this one is going to be 10.10.1.1. 255, 255, 255, 252 to give us our slash 30. So there we've assigned it an IP address. I'm going to do two other things to this tunnel that we don't need to do. Um, for the sakes of this demonstration, but if, if you're going to really build a tunnel, you, you may want to add these statements in. The first one I'm going to do is tell it the tunnel to do its own path MTU discovery because it's going over the internet. And the last thing I want to do is because we're going to be using OSPF on this tunnel, I'm basically telling it the same thing uh, to keep OSPF packets nice and neat. Okay, so do show IP interface brief. And there we go. Our tunnel 101 uh, 10, 10, it's got an IP address. It's up down because we added that keep alive statement, so it really cannot reach its destination. Uh, so it's in an up down state right now. Let's hop on over to router 2 and configure the tunnel interface on router 2. Um, basically the same way. So here we are on router 2. Uh, we're gonna first step was to create the tunnel interface interface tunnel zero uh, we're gonna give it okay so it went uh, to down we're going to give it um, a tunnel source and just like our last router um, this is all relative to where the router sits from so from router 2's perspective it's fast zero zero is the source and this routers public IP address is the destination so the source is going to be fast, 0 slash 0, just like it was on the other side. The tunnel destination is the public IP address of router 1. So let me slide this over so we can see it. 162.27.193. Uh, and the actual interface is dot 130. 130. Now we should see the same thing again here. I'm going to hit this enter. If you remember on the last time, it's told us our interface switched to up, up. Uh, and we saw the same thing here. Um, I'm going to add the keep alive. I think I used 3, 2 on the other one. Now what we should see this time though is the keep alive should stay up. The tunnel is now established. If we uh, show IP interface brief, we see that there. Uh, we did not give it an IP address on this side. So interface tunnel 0, IP address is going to be 10.10.1.2 let's look at our diagram again so 10.10.1 slash 30 so this one gets 1 this one gets 2 so it's going to be dot 2 subnet mask 255 255 255 252 and then while I'm in here I'm going to add those same other cleanup commands MTU path this oh I hit the cap block path uh, discovery and we are going to be using OSPF, so IP OSPF MTU ignore, just to keep our tunnel working well with the, uh, the OSPF protocol. So again, let me get out of the interface. Interface brief. There's our tunnel. It's got an IP address. It's up up. 
Uh, you notice this time, as I mentioned, the tunnel did not go down after we kept the keep alive. Our, our tunnel is established now. So let's go back to router 1, and we should see that the interface came back up, and it did. Tunnel 0 came back up. So the first time the keep alive kept it down because there was no uh, interface for it to, to do a keep alive against, now it's up. So we can see it on the other side. Now the thing to know about tunnels is they're layer 3 so we are not going to see this even though on a network map uh, it looks like it's directly connected logically uh, from this perspective ah that's the interface with the ISP the ISP router uh, but from this routers perspective it does not see router 2 as a directly connected neighbor so let's do a couple of verification tests again back into router 1 uh, let me let's see uh, show IP interface brief uh, show IP interface brief so it should be able to ping the other side of that tunnel 10.10.1.2 .10 .10 .2, uh, and it can so we're pinging we're sending ping packets from this device to this virtual interface on router 2 now you know that I had mentioned uh, that we set up OSPF process first because we want to see the neighbors come up as the tunnel was built and uh, you also notice up here on step four I said we're gonna have to update OSPF to make that happen now the reason we have to do that is because when I added the network statements in step one for OSPF I did not include the the virtual tunnel interfaces because we hadn't created them yet so what we need to do is go back into router one go into the router OSPF process and add uh, the 10.10.1.0.0.0.0.0 and the 10.10.1.0.0.0.0.3 into area 0. So now we're telling it that yes you can form neighbor relationships on that new interface that we just created, that tunnel interface. Again wildcard mask um, so that's why we're using dot three there. And then we're just gonna take this and we're gonna go over to router 2 and we're gonna go into our router OSPF123 process and we're just gonna put that statement in there same network now we should see our OSPF neighbors come up there we go Jason C change tunnel came up excellent excellent and if we do show IP OSPF neighbor we see the neighbor uh, this is router 2's perspective we see the neighbor ID uh, using this address on its interface and because it's a point-to-point -point circuit we're only seeing full. Uh, point this out right here when you're looking at OSPF if you recall your OSPF when it's trying to figure out a neighbor ID or a router ID and if it is not specified in the OSPF clause which we did not do it's going to pick an, a router ID based on IPs assigned to interfaces. Uh, and if memory serves it's the highest IP address that will win but if there's a loopback configured on uh, the router it's the highest loopback rather than the highest physical interface so back here on our network drawing I had said that we had this network behind it um, and this is actually a loopback I simulated this network on router 1 with a loopback and router 2 with a loopback that's why the 192.168.1.1 uh, is picked for the neighbor ID from uh, on routers 2. Router 2 is going to advertise its router ID as being 10.1.1.1.0. So let's verify that. We go over to router 1. Let's do a show IP OSPF neighbor. And there we are. The neighbor ID 10.1.1.1 because that's the highest loopback on router 2 over here. Again, this is a loopback. It's up in the up in, in full state uh, using tunnel 0. Now let's see if we're exchanging routes show IP route if I can type and so there we are indeed router 1 is learning about the 10 network 10, 10 uh, the uh, 10 one, 1 network excuse me from which is over here on router 2 is learning it from OSPF using this GRE tunnel okay so we've accomplished our steps here we've created the process uh, and I guess I could have done it all at once 1 and 4 didn't need to be separate steps 
Uh, create, we created the tunnel interfaces. We added some extra commands to keep them clean. Specified source and destination and uh, IP addresses. And uh, we updated OSPF with the virtual interfaces from the tunnels. And then we did some verification commands. Now, our next step, now that we have our tunnel up and running and the OSPF process running through it, our next step is going to be to start to add the security layer to our tunnel. So what we've done so far is two out of the three things we wanted to uh, accomplish. One was uh, these are now in one logical OSPF area. They're communicating to each other through a virtual GRE tunnel. But at this point, that tunnel is unsecure. There's no encryption algorithms on it. So even though this is a virtual interface, a virtual tunnel, it's still going through the Internet. So we still want to protect and encapsulate and, and our traffic between these two routers so that they can't be, it can't be sniffed on the internet or in, intercepted somewhere along the path. And that is going to be our next piece where we're going to start putting the VPN framework around our GRE tunnel. I've updated our network map to show what we're going to do in this section of the instructions. And this is the final instruction. Right now, uh, the third piece of what we set out to do was to encrypt our traffic as it goes across the internet because even though we have a logical GRE tunnel and it looks like our traffic is going directly between these two routers uh, from a, a network map perspective an IP perspective and, and even the routing protocol perspective it really is going over the internet and we want to protect that traffic so it, if it's uh, captured or sniffed upon it's encrypted and can't be inspected so we are going to be employing standard VPN tunnel mechanisms uh, to our GRE tunnel to make it as secure as any other VPN uh, connection. So I've put on the, the screen here the, the steps that we need to do to make that happen. Uh, and I'll run through those really quickly here. The first one is we have to tell each router what is the traffic that we want it to encrypt when it goes to the internet. When this router sends traffic from the users down here to the internet, we don't want all that traffic encrypted. Only, only traffic that's going from router 1 to router 2 do we want encrypted. So we need to tell it that. Um, then we need to start defining our IPsec policies. And there's traditionally two phases to an IPsec encryption mechanism. One is the ISACMP, which is phase 1, and the second, which is uh, IPsec, which is the true IPsec, uh, and that's phase 2. For phase one ISACAMP, we're going to be using a pre-shared secret instead of using certificates, so we have to define our, our pre-shared secret key. Uh, number five, step number five, is we take the interesting traffic, the ISACAMP policy, and the tra IPsec transform set, and we combine them all together into our crypto map. And the crypto map is, is where the magic happens. Once we have defined our crypto map, we take that crypto map and we apply it to the interfaces on our routers. And then uh, last but not least, we'll do some show commands and verification to make sure that traffic that's between these two routers going across this GRE tunnel is indeed encrypted. So step one, we're going to hop on to router one. Pull this into the window. And on router one, get back into enable mode. The first thing we want to do is define the traffic to be encrypted. When we look at our network map from router one's perspective, any traffic going from router ones to router two across the internet, that's the traffic we want to be encrypted. So that's how we're defining our interesting traffic. So to define that traffic, it's simply an, an access list. Access list, we'll call it's going to be an extended access list. We'll call it IPsec traffic. And I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but the reason I capitalize uh, things like this is so that I can find them quickly in a running config. So usually when I have to create a name for something, I'll, I'll almost always give it all caps so that it stands out in a config. Okay, our access list is going to be a one-liner. We're going to have, uh, we can put a remark in here. Remark, uh, let's call this VPN traffic. Uh, and then we're going to say permit permit ta traffic type. Probably you're used to using uh, IP or TCP or UDP. Those are the most common. But if you look in here, you'll see that we actually have an option to specify GRE traffic. That's what we want to pick in this case. So permit GRE from host, uh, the public IP address 
of router 1, which is the IP assigned to FAST00. So that is 162.27. Slide this out of the way. Dot 193. Dot, what was it? 130. Dot 130. And the destination is host, and that's the public IP address over here on router two. That is going to be 45.12. Whoa. 12.153. Dot two zero two, and I just want to verify these because these are easy to do typos on four five dot one two one forty three two o two on that side, and on this side it's one sixty two twenty seven one ninety three one thirty. Okay, so that's the access list that we're going to use to define the interesting traffic again from router one's perspective. On router 2's perspective, these are just going to be flip-flop. The source is going to be this router 2's WAN IP address, and the destination is going to be uh, router 1's WAN IP address. All right, so that's it. We've done uh, step one up here in our, in, our, in our list up here, define the traffic to be encrypted. Next is our phase one ISIC camp policy. To do that, we, when, when we start getting into VPNs, almost everything is with crypto. So we do crypto. ISACAMP policy and we're just going to create policy number one. Uh, I'm only going to create one policy. We're going to make a match on each side but uh, in, in many instances you might have di many different ISACAMP policies and for phase two many different transform sets. Uh, we're only going to do one because we're going to force them to match. Uh, so we give it a policy and then once we define the the policy number we have to give it the basic information that we want it to use for phase one of our tunnel. Uh, what we need to tell it is what kind of authentication mechanism we're going to use, the encryption method we want to use, the Diffie-Hellman group we want to use, the hash method that we want to use, and the lifetime that we want the tunnel to stay up before it needs to be torn down and rebuilt automatically. So let's start with authentication and our choices are certificate based or pre-shared key. We're going to use a pre-shared key which we will define um, shortly. The next thing that we want to do is, is to take care of our encryption method. When we look at that, we have two, uh, three options, triple DES, DES, and AES. We're going to use AES. And uh, we can specify uh, the bit depth that we want the key to be. So we're going to go with, oh, we'll go with 128, which is the default. Uh, the next thing that we want to define is the hash. We've got uh, MD5 or SHA. We're going to use SHA. The next thing that we need to define is the Diffie-Hellman group. Say group, and we're going to use group number two. Uh, the last parameter, if you remember, was lifetime. I'm not going to override the lifetime, but if we want to look at it, we can specify the lifetime in seconds. Uh, the default is the 86400, I believe, and that's that should be 24 hours, if, if I remember correctly. I'm not going to specify a lifetime, so we've, uh, I'm not going to override the lifetime, so we've got that taken care of. Now, because it, we used the pre shared key, if you remember up here, we had options to use for our, uh, sorry, for our, um, where, where is it at? I'm missing it here. Right here. For our authentication mecha mechanism, we, uh, we had the option, we, we chose to use a pre shared key. Now we need to define that pre-shared key. We got to tell it what that pre-shared key is going to be. So we do again crypto isocamp key. Uh, we're going to do zero. It's going to be an unencrypted key. The next thing is to what is the key we want to use. We're going to use the word key all in uppercase as our key or as our password, if you will. Uh, the next thing we have to specify is an address. In this case, because it's going across the internet. And then what is the address of the remote host that this tunnel is going to be uh, paired with? And in this case, because we're on router 1, that is going to be the WAN IP address of router 2 over here. So we type that in very carefully, 45.12.153.202, 45.12.153.202, enter. Okay, so we have completed. 
what numbers numbers two and number three up here. We've we've completed our ISA account policy with our encryption and our hash and and our and our Diffie Hellman groups, uh, and we've defined the pre-shared key because that's the authentication mechanism that we chose to use. So let's do a quick show run, and we'll see how that looks in the running config. So here we are. Here's our crypto ISA account policy number one. Uh, the encryption mechanism we chose was AES, and because we picked 128, that's the default. It doesn't show it in the config here. Pre-shared key, Diffie-Hellman group 2. And then also we have uh, the, the crypto, the, the pre-shared key that we want to use for the phase 1 tunnel to be built up. Now you'll notice one thing that's missing here is our hash. We specified hash as being SHA. Again, that's a default, so it does not show it in the running config. Had we chosen um, another mechanism for our, our hash, uh, MD5, we would see that showing in the run because it is not the default. Um, so that's why it appears to be missing. Okay, so we've got that taken care of. Now we are on to step four, which is phase two of, of our... Phase two of IPsec, and that's actually defining the transform set. So again, we are going to uh, we start with crypto, and instead of ISA camp, we're doing phase two, which is IPsec. We're going to create a transform set. That's the the mechanism or the the method that they call it. Uh, we have to give it a name. We're going to call it trans set gre. Kind of long, I know, but I like to be descriptive. Uh, transform set GRE tunnel and then we have to give it a couple parameters behind here so we are going to use ESP we're going to use AES ESP hyphen AES and if we wanted to we could specify the strength that we're going to use on that 128 192 256 we'll leave it at the default which is 128 and then the other thing that we need to specify is that we're going to use SHA so ESP hyphen SHA and hit enter. Okay, and then the last thing we want to do is say mode. We have a couple of different modes that we can have our transform set be defined for, and we're going to use it for a tunnel mode. Hit enter. All right, let's look. Let's do a show run here again, real quick. So we have. Uh, there's our policy, there's our, our shared key, and here's our, our transform set that we just typed in. The transform set is all one line. And you can do multiple transform sets if you wanted to, or multiple, uh, just like you can do multiple ISA camp policies. So if you have multiple tunnels going and you want to use different authentication encryption mechanisms on the different tunnels, you, you have that flexibility. All right, so back over to here we are now on step five step five is where we take our our access list our phase one and our phase two information and we tie it all together into an item called a crypto map a crypto map is what brings it all together so we're going to hop over to router one again and we're going to create our crypto map uh, crypto options there's lots of options you know we've been doing IPsec ISAC a couple in the middle we've done the key in this case we're gonna do a map what do we want to call it I'm gonna call it crypto map to be really tricky and we give it a sequence number one and then what are we what methods are we using we're using IP well, we're using IPsec with ISAC uh, that was what we decided to use for our phase one and phase two so when we hit enter, we get this message that tells us that our policy is going to be disabled until we define a few things. Basically, in our crypto map, we have to bring in all the other information we put together. We've got to tell it the peer that this crypto map is going to be used against. We need to tell it uh, the access list that tells it which traffic to apply this, this, this crypto policy to. And then, although it's not stated in the text, we also need to tell it the phase one and phase two information. So we can uh, do a description here if we want to. Description, we'll just call it 2R2 just so that we can put a description in there. Uh, the first thing we'll do, let's do them in the order that we created them in. So we need to uh, do our access list. That's done with a match command. Match, address, and then the name of our access list, which is IPsec-trans. hyphen 
traffic. So that took care of one of our requirements here. Um, this one right here, a valid access list has been configured. That's our access list. We need to do a set peer. And that's the other thing it tells us we need to do. And we need to enter the IP address of the peer. Uh, what is this? What is the what's on the other end of this tunnel? Now we've defined that a few times already up here, so I'm just going to copy and paste it from here, but it's the WAN IP address of our partner router. All right, and the last thing that we need to do is we need to uh, uh, specify the transform set that we just created. So again, we say set transform set, and the transform set is that big long name that we typed in up here, trans set GRE, trans set GRE tunnel. So we specified the peer as we were required. We specified the access list that uh, we created to define the GRE traffic going across that tunnel. And we set our transform set. So now we are ready to apply the crypto map to our interfaces. And to, for the sake of brevity, I have already gone on router 2 and created the the access list, the, phase, the ISA camp policy, the IPsec transform set, and also the crypto map. So the only differences on router 2's perspective is wherever we had to enter a peer ID is going to be the WAN address of router 1. So when we had to do that for our peers for here, we had to do it for the crypto key and of course our access list, um, the hosts are flip-flop because of, of the way the access lists work. So right now we have our tunnel up and it's sending traffic back and forth. We've seen that all along what we are going to do is apply the crypto map that we just created. Now when we apply the crypto map we have to apply it to two interfaces. We have to apply it to our logical GRE tunnel and we also have to apply it to our physical FAST00 because that's where the traffic is really going through. So let's go to interface FAST0 slash 0 first. We type crypto map and then the name of our crypto map which we called crypto map and hit enter. Now we are going to see that we start getting some warning messages here. Um, because the crypt, I've created the other stuff on router 2 but I haven't applied the crypto map to the interfaces. So what's going to happen, here we are, tunnel 0 went down. It went to a down state. So that's something to keep in mind when uh, you're doing this. That uh, if you do the, if you're actually sending business traffic across that circuit and you're going to go back and apply the security at a later date uh, you need to do it off hours because it's going to take that interface down while you do that take take that tunnel down um, and then we also need to go to interface tunnel zero and apply the crypto map CRYPTO to tunnel uh, to the tunnel interface as well all right, so that takes care of uh, router one. Now I'm going to flip over to router two. We're not going to recreate all that st the the uh, ISA camp and the transform set because I've already done that here. I've already created the crypto map as well. We're just going to apply the crypto map. So we go into interface tunnel zero, crypto map, and the name crypto map, and we go to interface fast zero slash zero. Uh, crypto map and then the name C R Y P T O map. Now we should see our tunnel come back up. We should see our ISP OSP. Uh, excuse me. We should see OSPF relationship come back up, and we should see routes being exchanged. And there we go. Our tunnel came back up, came to an up state, and we see that our our BGP neighbors, uh, our excuse me, our uh, our OSPF neighbors have transformed and uh, transitioned to a full state. And if we go back to router one, which was where we saw the tunnel go down, we see that it's gone back up. Remember, it went down uh, up here. Right here, we saw the tunnel go down. Here, it's coming back up, and here we see that OSPF has gone into a full state as well. So back on router one again, seeing as we're here, let's continue. If we do show IP OS. PF neighbor, we should see there we are, router 2 as our neighbor again. And uh, now, 
let's see if our traffic is being encrypted. To see that, we use a show crypto uh, IPsec, because that's where the encryption really takes place, is at the, at the IPsec level, and we do SA for security associations. Now, here's the there's all kinds of good information in here, but here's the part that you want to look at to see if, if your traffic's being encrypted. What this is telling us is from Router1's perspective, uh, as of when we ran this command, it encapsulated 65 packets and encrypted 65 packets. And here's what it received. It decrypted 64 and 64. 64 went from Router1 to Router2. Six, I'm sorry, 65 went from Router1 to Router2. 64 came from Router2 back to Router1. Now, because we're running OSPF and we got those keep alives on our tunnel, we should see if we run that command again, that number climbing. So there it went up. Uh, let's jack this up a little bit so we can see uh, those numbers take a big hit. So we're gonna we're gonna ping router two. Ping IP 10.10.1.2. Repeat of let's do 50. So we're sending 50 pings across that tunnel. Now what we should see is uh, the number of packets should go up by 50 plus whatever other overhead took place in that time. So I would expect to see it jump up to 150 plus. So let's take a look at our SA. And there we go. It went from uh, 96 to uh, 172. And we see the same thing from router 2's perspective. If we do that same command, uh, show, show, good lord, show crypto IPsec security associations, we can see they're going to pretty much be flip flop for one another. What one receives, the other one sends. So that is proof that we've uh, we've encrypted our traffic going across that tunnel. And remember, that tunnel is really going across the internet. So we're encrypting our our private secure traffic, our private corporate traffic, as it goes across the internet. So there we go. We've we've we set out to accomplish three goals, and uh, we've done all three of them. We've we've uh, created the GRE tunnel interface as a layer three interface. We put these two routers that are connected directly to the internet and they're in the same OSPF area. Dynamic routing updates are going from router 1 to router 2 using this virtual private tunnel. And then we've taken that, uh, that, that logical interface and we've secured that traffic using IPsec so that when it goes through the internet, physically goes through the internet, it's encapsulated and encrypted and, sec and secured traffic flows through the internet so our traffic can't be intercepted and inspected. So I hope you found this tutorial informative. Thank you for watching.